All right. I consent. I do consent. <laughs> Great. All right, we're ready. Uh, okay, so I know everyone has too much Zoom, so I'm going to try to sort of, no, I won't go through all the details. I think I might skip some of the slides. I'll try to shoot for maybe 30 to 40 minutes. Um, so hopefully just give a sense of the different parts of the project and some of it, this is sort of meant as a philosophy talk, um, but then I think the philosophy will just sort of come at the end. So I hope, hopefully this is pretty accessible to people. Um, so the title is a virtue theoretic exploration of the value of identity diversity. That's a mouthful, um, it's sort of a philosophy talk mouthful. Uh, but really what I'm gonna do is try to talk a little bit about what I take to be the state of the debate and the state of the field insofar as people talk about the value of diversity. I'm gonna raise a problem and a question that people might have. And then I'm gonna talk about how some tools in philosophy and a framework in philosophy might help us in this area. Um, so I am not a total expert in the sociology of this stuff, but I've now read a little bit. So hopefully um, if there are sociologists and psychologists and other people who study this, please, I would love your opinion and um, your thoughts on it. Okay, so let me just give a little bit of a background just tell you a little bit about what the research project is and um, sort of how I'm approaching things, what my interest is in here. So I got I got interested in all this stuff sort of uh, independently. I was just reading a lot of the, the sort of science about diversity. And then, um, you know, I just started having certain questions about not only the science and the upshot, but sort of I thought that philosophers could have something to say about the way the sort of value talk uh, that was um, that people are engaged in in the field. Okay, so, so the questions of interest are sort of pretty broad. Um, why is diversity valuable? What type of diversity is valuable? Sorry, I don't know why I lowered myself or hired myself. Um, and here, I'm gonna be focusing on the epistemic and practical value of diversity. So I will briefly mention, talk about the sort of moral value of diversity or the social value of diversity. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm going to primarily talk about the epistemic or practical value. So what I mean by that is just the value that diverse groups have um, when we're trying to answer questions or when we're trying to figure out what we believe, when we're trying to produce knowledge, uh, maybe even uh, spread knowledge. Uh, I'm also going to be talking about the practical value of diversity. So this is the value that diversity has in helping us achieve our goals, whatever our goals they are. And I'm gonna be focusing, so even though a lot of the talk is gonna be talking about um, what I'm gonna call cognitive or functional diversity, really the thing I'm interested in is trying to understand the value of identity diversity. So I think a lot of people are familiar with that term. Um, I'll briefly talk about it later, but here I just mean a diversity of social categories. Um, so the different sort of ways in which we socially categorize ourselves in terms of gender, sex, ethnicity, religion, um, things of that sort. And so what ideally what we want is sort of what we want in any science. We want an empirically supported theory of diversity that supplies sort of clear laws, some generalizations about diversity. And here, since we're interested in why diversity is valuable, we want some generalizations or statements about uh, to sort of, so Scott Page, who's a sociologist um, that I, whose work I really like, he talks about it as a diversity bonus or the logic of a diversity bonus. So, um, Here's uh, just to frame sort of what my sort of particular interest is in the debate is that I take, so I, I don't always have the best sense of what the public understanding of the debate is or how people think the state of the debate is, which is often uh, not close to what the actual state of the debate is, but I take the public understanding of the debate to be something like this, which is that identity, identity diversity. So if groups, institutions promote identity diversity, that comes with certain practical or epistemic costs or at the very least, there's not necessarily any practical or epistemic benefits. But nevertheless, that's traded off with its moral gains. So if say Google promotes identity diversity amongst its ranks, it's not necessarily for the sake of promoting um, certain practical or epistemic benefits, but it's for the sake of promoting sort of equity, uh, promoting justice, promoting equality of opportunity. Um, so I take that to be sort of the general understanding of debate. Uh, and I think there's lots of skepticism. I know there's ideological skepticism um, about the value of identity diversity, 
But I also think that there's some valid skepticism. Um, that is, so I think that there are questions about why it is that groups and institutions ought to care about identity diversity. And what I'm gonna, part of one of my goals in this talk is to try to clarify that attitude and to try to sort of bring some validity to what it is that people are skeptical about. And I think there is, um, in some sense, sort of a lack of understanding about the value of identity diversity in, in the field. Um, so I'll, hopefully I'll make that clear later. later. Next, the other goal I want to, and this is, I think, what was missing in, uh, sort of missing in my previous version of this talk, sorry, uh, is to propose a way of understanding the practical epistemic value of identity diversity. Sorry, identity diversity. Um, so I, I'm going to provide what I think is a philosophical framework that will help us, will give us sort of the language and tools to try to give a better account of what the value of identity diversity is, or at least a richer account. All right, so uh, here's a quick structure of um, what I'm gonna be talking about. So I'll, I'll talk about, I'll actually talk a lot about cognitive diversity. I'm gonna talk about what I take to be the standard sort of view and picture that sociologists have presented about the value of cognitive diversity. I'll then show um, sort of transition from the value of cognitive diversity to the value of identity diversity. In fact, um, the value of identity diversity often depends on the argument and case we have for the value of cognitive diversity. I'll then talk a little bit about some worries and problems with the, the resulting view and try to clarify what I take to be uh, sort of the issue or the a certain type of skepticism about the value of identity diversity. And then I'll propose an alternative um, framework to think about the issue that I think is hopefully is fruitful. And I give a particular example of that type of approach. Oh, sorry. I think there are slides that I was I hid, but are no longer being hid. So, okay. So we're first going to talk about cognitive diversity. Um, so you might have heard that term under different labels. So sometimes people talk about functional diversity. I mean the same thing. Um, so I'm taking this um, this I, way of understanding cognitive diversity from Scott Page again. So he likes to talk about cognitive diversity in terms of repertoire diversity. Uh, so I think this is pretty useful. So when we think about a diversity of cognitive tools or um, our cognitive abilities, you can sort of think about it in two categories. So people have certain perspectives that can be facts or knowledge that they have. That can be uh, ways of representing the world, uh, depending upon the sort of conceptual schemes and frameworks you use. Uh, suppose you come from a more formal background, you have a certain way of modeling and representing things. Suppose you come from a more qualitative background, you have a way of modeling and representing things. Um, that's also true of the types of explanations we engage in. We can give sort of statistical explanations, causal explanations, we can um, sort of engage in narratives. So those are all ways in which we can, a perspective on the world, ways in which we try to understand the world. Uh, there's also heuristics. So these are ways in which we solve problems. So the rules that we have, the methods that we have for solving problems. So a chemist will have a different set of rules and methods for problem solving as well a philosopher. Um, so that's just give you a sense of what we mean by our sort of our cognitive tools or repertoires. All right. Okay, so uh, what we want when we want a lot logic of the cognitive diversity bonus. So, you know, when, when diver cognitive diversity brings about benefits uh, is we want a model of diversity. We want a model of diverse groups. So we want to have understanding what it means when we say something is a cognitively diverse group or more or less cognitively diverse group. Uh, we need some sort of measure for success given a task. And then we need some rules or generalizations that say when it is that having a cognitively diverse group will be beneficial or costly. So I'm going to give, um, I should say that I, I, I first thought about going through a bunch of examples, which I don't think is going to be that useful. Um, I'll, I'll say this, which is, we'll, we'll, we'll see when we turn to talk about identity diversity, that what, what we have when we talk about cognitive diversity, I think is admirably clear models about how the diverse cognitive diversity of a group is connected to its ability to, to perform <laughs> those tasks. So I think that oftentimes we have like a really, really nice picture that gives us a clear understanding of why it is that cognitive diversity is valuable and when. Um, 
as we'll see, I think that we don't have as good of a picture when it comes to identity diversity. We have a sort of fairly simple idea. So I'm not, I was gonna give a bunch of different models that people give, and I was gonna try to do it from a really simple toy model to one that's more realistic and applicable, but I think it'll sort of just introduce the idea to just talk about this really simple toy model. Um, and if people have questions about maybe how we can apply these things to real life, uh, we can talk about it. Um, okay, so here's the toy model. Again, it comes from Scott Page's book, The Diversity Bonus, which is a great book. I highly recommend it to anybody. Um, so, uh, so first, she has a really simple, so again, this is a toy model, just to introduce the idea, get, get our sort of understanding, uh, raise our understanding about how these things work. So, uh, so we have three individuals, Anne, Barry, and Cam. Uh, we're going to talk about their cognitive tools that they have, and we're just going to label them um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And what we're going to say is their cognitive tools is just the set of tools that they have. So, uh, and we could roughly measure their ability by the number of tools they have. So Anne is the most stable, Barry, and then Cam. Um, but then if we think about creating groups, so first we have to ask, well, what happens when we put people in a group? How do their tools sort of all combine in a way that produces group ability? So let's think of a really simple idea, which is you just take all the members of the group and you take their union. That is like, you just count all the tools that the group has as a whole. So if we have Anne and Barry in a group, we count all the tools that they have together. And it turns out they just have a lot of tool overlap. So um, their ability is six. They have six tools available to them. And Barry and Cam have a lot less tools overlapping. And so they, as a group, they're more able. They have no more tools available to them. Uh, what's really interesting about this is that Anne and Barry are the most capable or, indi or able individuals in this group. Um, whereas Barry and Cam have less tools. But nevertheless, if you put Barry and Cam into a group, the group is more capable than Anne and Barry. Right? So that's a nice example of how diverse groups can be more able than the groups of them. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. That's a really, that's a terribly written sentence. But diverse groups can be better than the groups of the most able individuals. I think there's another really important lesson here, which is that we often think that what we should do when we're creating groups is we should have a test or a measure of who has the most merit or most or is best. And then we just pick all the best people. Uh, but that's clearly false, right? That's clearly a problematic way of creating groups. So if you're, say, um, the HR of a company, you shouldn't just have a test and just pick the people who do best on the test because it really matters how these people come together as a group and what their group dynamic is. Okay, I think I'm gonna skip this uh, also because when you, I have to say, if you're gonna use a Zoom function, you can't do videos. Um, so I'll just like really briefly explain what's going on. So I just wanted to give a lot of like a very, very different model. So this comes from computer science. There are these genetic or evolutionary algorithms that try to get inspiration from uh, evolution. And so the idea is to kind of use the evolutionary process to search through a space and find an optimal solution. And uh, long story short, the too long didn't read version is that if you just, uh, so in evolution, you take a population and you suppose you select amongst that population to propagate and you just select the most fit individuals. Uh, what you end up with is what's called a local optimum. You get a good outcome, but it's not the best. What you have to also have is a diverse population, a diverse genetic pool. And so the sort of lesson from these types of algorithms is that not only is fitness or ability important, but also diversity is important. So it's a slightly different lesson from the previous model. The previous model is that sometimes the best groups are not the ones of the most fit individuals. This one is that both fitness and diversity are both important. They're equally important. Yeah, they don't. Oh, shoot. Oh, OK, yeah. They do not let you do video. All right, so um, what's the upshot of some of these different models? So I'd say another really interesting model actually comes from philosophers of science. Um, so they often use these game theoretic models to try to show how these sort of interactions over time um, can be beneficial when you have diverse groups. Uh, so that's, that's something that people are interested in, I could point them to. Uh, so what's the logic of cognitive diversity? What's sort of the lesson from all these different models? Um, the lesson's, I think, a somewhat intuitive one, 
which is that given a particular task with the right features, diversity can be valuable in getting us closer to a particular goal. Uh, so in the first type of example with the tools, uh, given a problem solving task where no single individual has all the tools, so that's really important here, that it's an, a difficult task, we need lots of tools, then a diversity of tools can be can help us get come to the right solution or a good solution. Um, I didn't go through the evolutionary case, but say finding an optimal value or finding an optimal solution um, with communication and collaboration, that's kind of what um, sort of propagation of or evolution is supposed to mimic, uh, then a diversity of guesses or diversity of perspectives can help us come to the optimal solution. Sorry, that, that probably doesn't make any sense, but it's fine. Uh, okay, so, but the, the generic lesson is that for complex tasks, things that are hard, they can benefit from cognitive diversity. That's the, the simple lesson. Okay, so some, some examples um, from real life, because what, again, what we want is some evidence that these are empirically verified or confirmed generalizations. Um, so one, I think, has, has been studied a lot. And I haven't read the book, but I think there's a book called Super Predictors or something like that. Um, and this often has to do with the sort of wisdom of crowds idea, is that when it comes to predictive tasks, so when you're predicting or estimating something you don't know about, say, who's going to win the Super Bowl? How many of the of rain are going to come in February? Uh, when there's going to be herd immunity in California, uh, then I'm not going to go through this, but uh, so there's a way of sort of calculating, take a group, how reliable or good is that group? So how much error will they have? Well, it turns out that that, so the, the equation is up there. It turns out that depends upon individual abilities. So the average ability of each individual, that's what average error calculates minus its predictive diversity. Um, that means that the, that the a diverse group will always be more accurate than the average of its members. That is the predicted diversity lowers the collective error. It makes the group more, uh, it makes the group better. It makes the group more reliable. Uh, another thing this says is that the group's accuracy depends upon both individual accuracy and the group diversity. Uh, another corollary of this is that the accuracy of the group can be improved by either adding a more accurate predictor or a more diverse predictor. Um, so I, I didn't explain what that, why that equation is true, but that equation just says that both, individ, both individual ability in a group and its diversity is both equally important for the group's ability to make accurate predictions. So an interesting example of this, uh, come, is that if anyone's familiar with the Netflix prize, uh, I forgot, I guess this was in 2008 it started. So Netflix had this million dollar prize that said if any group could improve its predictive system, its recommendation system by over 10%, um, then it would give a million dollar prize. It turned out after a while that no group was getting over that 10% mark. And so uh, one of the groups, the number one group decided to combine with the number two group and so this is, and it turned out that the moment that they did, they went over that 10% mark. And there's a lot more to the story, but um, what's interesting is that the most reliable or the best group added a group that wasn't as good at, of, as, as it was doing. And because of the diversity of the models that they're using and different approaches they're using, um, as a group, they got better. And so that's sort of a famous now become a famous example of how uh, diversity can be really beneficial, especially cognitive diversity. The story turns out to be more interesting. And it's oddly enough, Netflix never used their recommendation system. So it was a nice uh, marketing tool for them. Netflix won in the end. They won the Game of Thrones. Um, OK, uh, another example is creative tasks. Uh, so uh, here's a way of thinking of creative tasks is try to think of new ideas or solutions. Um, what does it mean for someone to be more or less creative? Well, the number of ideas you can come up with, that's, that's a, a measure, or I think a test that some psychologists use. So the group ability, it's sort of natural to think of how many unique ideas a group comes up with. And you can, you can see as in the toolbox case that the most creative group is not just a group but the most creative individual. So again, what you don't wanna do is have a test to test who's the most creative and select just the most creative people. That's not how to pick the best group. And I'm going to skip over this explanation of this particular study. Uh, it's more complicated than 
as, as the graph may suggest. But uh, essentially, there is some correlation between adding functional diversity and creativity. Uh, so there, there are some, there's some empirical evidence that suggests that this is true, that uh, if you have cognitive diversity in groups, that can increase the creativity of a group. I, I want to skip this. OK, um, so obviously, there's costs of diversity. There's costs of both cognitive and identity diversity. Uh, here are some that we know about. So there's costs about how the group actually operates within the group. So obviously, there's communication difficulties. Sometimes there's integration problems, integration, integrating the different perspectives and problem solving tools. Oftentimes people aren't happy, there's more turnover. Um, so that's oddly true when you have groups of like different ages, there's more conflict and turnover. And there's problems with the outcomes, there's problems implementing the ideas sometimes. Um, and there's of course, more. there's moral costs. Uh, actually, I've read a lot of now philosophy of science having to do with sort of the epistemic value of diverse groups. Uh, and one of the really interesting outcomes of some of these models is they, they talk about how, and we've seen this, where uh, for the group or institution, they do better by adding diversity to the group. But in some sense, that propagates or magnifies some of the problems that were already present. So like an example of this is you can bring a diverse group of individuals into a group, but you can just take what they know and just use it, right? You can extract the knowledge that they have. You can extract the know-how they have, and you can, and they will, they will have no say in terms of what tasks they're performing, what goals there are. Um, and in fact, you might make things worse. So an example of this I read recently is that it can be true that the, there are benefits for groups in science to include minorities, but it might turn out that in doing so, um, underrepresented groups end up doing more and more work. So it might be good for them in some sense and good for science in some sense, but it might make some of the problems even worse. So, so sometimes the cost of adding cognitive diversity or identity diversity for the sake of its practical and epistemic goals can actually have moral problems attached to it. Okay, so um, let's move from cognitive diversity to identity diversity. Uh, I think that I'm interested in. Uh, actually, this, the story is going to be really simple. And in, um, it, it's simple, and so it's easy to understand. But also, I think it, it doesn't capture what a lot of us think is the value of identity diversity, at least intuitively. Uh, so I think I can skip sort of talking about identity diversity in any detail. Uh, I'm just going to use it to uh, equate that with social category diversity. Another way that sometimes people talk about this is as surface level diversity. Um, that's not always true when we're talking about identity diversity. We'll see later as I talk about my framework, it might be closer to surface level diversity because these are things that we see and we categorize people by when we see them. Um, so these are things like age, gender. So we don't, sometimes you see socioeconomic status, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you see um, religion, sometimes you don't. Um, so, but these are all social categories that we categorize people by, um, sometimes implicitly and sometimes automatically. So the standard argument is really simple. Um, and if people, so there are exceptions and I'll talk about one of them in particular uh, later on. But for the most part, when I've read a lot of the research, um, so even in Scott Page's book, uh, he goes, you know, he does this long sort of spiel about the value of cognitive diversity goes through all these models, goes through all this evidence. And then really what he says about identity diversity, even though he says a lot about what identity diversity is, he really just says, look, um, intuitively and uh, maybe experimentally, we see that if you have an identity diverse group, that produces cognitive diversity, which is intuitively correct. Right? So the standard argument is that identity diversity just correlates with cognitive diversity. And then the thought is that since cognitive diversity is beneficial and we sort of know why it's beneficial and when it's beneficial, then it just sort of, you, you get that along. So it's just sort of a means to an end. Um, so that does undermine some of the public understanding. So I think there's this public understanding that as I stated before, that identity diversity is somehow costly and it's traded off with the moral benefits. Uh, so I think this does undermine that assumption that identity diversity can sometimes be beneficial. 
Um, but I think there was going to be another sort of objection that's very similar. I think that still stands. So, so that's, um, that's the argument that identity diversity is valuable because it brings about cognitive diversity. So it's not valuable for its own sake, it's just valuable as an, as an instrumental means to an end. Um, so some evidence, and this is just sort of cor correlation that you can, you can look for. So companies uh, with at least one woman on the board typically has average higher returns and better growth. Um, they often have more female representation in management, often correlates with more innovation. Again, these are just correlations. Uh, the, on the murder mystery task, groups with racial diversity did a lot better than groups with no racial diversity. And sorry, ethnic, and, oh, this is something that's been studied a lot, which is eth ethnic diversity correlates with greater research impact uh, when we look at papers and their Im impact factors and citations and things of that sort. Okay, so let's get to, sorry, I'm gonna minimize myself. Um, Get to the worry or the worries that I have, and again, these are sort of those philosophers' worries. I don't know if they're um, people worries that most people have, but I'll try to translate them to more intuitive worries. Uh, so the the practical worry that is is from so what I was thinking about it. There's there's sort of a pragmatic worry, and I think this is a worry that I've heard from people, especially people in business environments, uh, when I talk to them about the value of identity diversity and promoting identity diversity um, in their ranks. So a lot of people say, look, I, I get that identity diversity can be valuable, but if we just care about it because it brings about cognitive diversity, and if identity diversity is such a divisive topic that brings about controversy, and we really, if we really just care about, say, um, creating services and products, then why well, care about, let's just stop talking about it or let's stop caring about it or stop focusing on it because it's just going to bring about controversy and it's, and we can get all the benefits by talking about cognitive diversity right so that's a pragmatic worry it's it's not an ideologue that has anything against identity diversity but it just doesn't want to rock the boat this is a person who doesn't want to rock the boat and wants to get all the benefits of diversity uh, i think there actually has the same source of the worry as a more theoretical worry which is, is there ever a reason to prioritize identity diversity? Do we ever lose out on something? And, and the next question is really the question that I think when I read all this literature, I think that this argument and account of the value of identity diversity doesn't really capture its value. I think a lot of us, when we think about why identity diversity is valuable, we think it's a, a valuable somehow for its own sake that it by itself brings about certain benefits, uh, not moral benefits, but really epistemic and practical benefits. And so what I wanna do is um, think like, what sort of framework can we use that better captures, I think what a lot of us think is the value of identity diversity without having to rely upon it bringing about cognitive diversity. So that's really the, the project I have in mind as a sort of, and then as a philosopher, I think that there are some philosophical frameworks that are valuable. Um, I found this useful because you might think that the question that I raised is something very specific to talking about the epistemic and practical value of identity diversity, but I think it actually comes up even if you're just talking about issues about justice and fairness and equity. Um, so I asked, you know, it's clear that cognitive diversity brings about practical and epistemic bonuses, so why should we ever prioritize identity diversity? Um, you might think when we're talking about equity, we're talking about fairness and justice, you might think that socioeconomic or structural diversity brings about bonuses. Uh, so why should we ever prioritize identity diversity? I think we have a much better answer um, when it comes to issues about fairness and justice than we do when it comes to matters of uh, epistemic or practical value. So, but, but still, I think the question still arises in both arenas. Okay, so this is, um, sorry for those of you who heard this talk, but now this is kind of new. So the thought is to appeal to a sort of virtue theory or the framework that especially virtue epistemologists have and uh, social epistemologists have to try to give a better account of the value of identity diversity. Okay, I'm gonna start with uh, what I take, I think most philosophers, if they re listen to this type of talk, they're like, okay, obviously like we have, we have an answer. Um, and I think it's true that that is the start of an answer. I don't think it's a, a, a full answer. Um, because I don't think it's general enough. So I'm not an expert on standpoint theory, but 
the obvious um, reply from a philosopher is like, what about standpoint theory? It seems like it has something to say about the value, epistemic value of identity diversity. Uh, so standpoint theory has, again, I'm not an expert, so some people might may be able to add more, uh, but one of the central features of this account is that being a member of a certain social category is necessary or a constitutive of having certain cognitive traits or certain epistemic traits. So the two sort of most famous examples are Marxist standpoint theory. Uh, so the idea is that the working class, the proletariat, in virtue of being part of the working class, is in a privileged epistemic standpoint, understand the workings of capitalism. Uh, they know better than the capital class to understand how, ca how capitalism works. Um, and the other uh, famous example of standpoint theory is feminist standpoint theory, which is that being a woman, in virtue of being a woman, um, you understand better how certain social power dynamics work in society. And it's in virtue of being part of a certain social category that you have those epistemic advantages and benefits. Okay, so, so, the, so since being part of a certain social category gives you those epistemic benefits or that epistemic advantage, then of course, identity diversity in some senses is, is the source or cause of the right cognitive diversity. We can't leave it out of the picture. We can't leave it out of the story. Um, and sort of obvious or less contentious cases than the Marxist or feminist ones. Um, if you're a business person, sorry, this is so like capitalistic. Uh, it originally started off through conversations with certain type of people. So still have the remnants of that. Uh, but marketing to a certain social group, or if you're a public policy maker, if you're a decision maker that affects certain social groups, obviously being a member of that social group, if you're part of the marketing team or the decision-making team is gonna be beneficial. Okay, so I think that's a great start. Um, I just don't think, I think it's a limited defense of identity diversity, but I think it's a lesson that we should take. Um, I just find it, not a full answer because it just defends identity diversity in a specific set of tasks and cases. And I don't think it has a right type of generality to it. So that's what I'm looking for. Okay, so I wanna, I, I'm sort of got inspired um, both by thinking from the perspective of standpoint theory, but also from some social science research. And um, in fact, the, the person that I felt really inspired by was Catherine Phillips who unfortunately passed away recently from cancer. Uh, but her work, I think, is some of the, the best work on the value of diversity, um, in part because she was studying the sort of causal benefits of identity diversity. So she wanted to really try to show that there's some causal relationships between identity diversity and um, certain beneficial outcomes. Uh, so this is either her or, or people who work with her or sort of the people she's inspired. Uh, or people who work in that area. So one of the things we found out is that people work harder in identity diverse environments. Um, so they found in these sort of mock juries with racially diverse groups that they remembered more information when they were in racially diverse groups. Another thing um, that we found, and this is, I found really interesting is that when you go into a diverse group and you, so you, so, and you, there's disagreement there's much more tolerance. People aren't as upset or irritated as opposed to when you enter into a homogeneous group and there's disagreement. So, so that's really interesting. Just, just in virtue of being in a certain type of group with a certain diversity or homogeneity, uh, that's gonna affect your behavior in both cases. That affects how people behave and act, which we all know. Um, so, so the idea is to take that idea and to apply that to thinking about the epistemic and practical benefits of being in diverse groups. Okay, so uh, the lesson I'm taking is that somehow just seeing difference, the expectation of difference is brought about by the fact that one sees differences, right? So you enter into a group that you, you see lots of different social categories and that can cause people to act and behave differently. And then the empirical evidence suggests that in fact, that expectation of difference or seeing the difference uh, can be associated or actually can cause certain epistemic virtues. So the epistemic virtues and character of a group, its behavior, its epistemic behavior can depend upon surface level diversity, what people see when they enter into a group. Uh, and, and that leads us directly to virtue theory. So, uh, so people who aren't familiar with this, sort of, especially in epistemology, uh, 
I think the tradition or the sort of classical story about the tradition of epistemology is that there's been a focus on the individual and not only the individual, but a particular beliefs. And also there's been a limitation in terms of the way that we talk about aesthetic values. Typically all people talk about is knowledge or justified belief or rational belief. So a lot of virtue theorists say, look, um, let's stop thinking so narrowly. Let's talk about the whole character of an individual. Let's talk about groups. Let's talk about institutions. And let's expand the range of the epistemic values we're talking about. Let's not just talk about knowledge, let's talk about wisdom. Let's talk about epistemic courage. Let's talk about epistemic justice. So, um, so I really like the, the thought that we should expand our scope of our inquiries. And another thing that virtue theorists want to talk about is they want to talk about how sort of lower level traits can manifest into sort of when we talk about the epistemic character or virtues of a whole individual. And you can see that that sort of comes up when we're talking about diversity of groups. I just mentioned that the lesson we should take from social science is that oftentimes the sort of makeup of a group can affect its epistemic character and virtue and the behavior that it engages in. So the thought is that this sort of virtue theoretic way of talking about talking about whole groups and talking about the epistemic virtue and character um, can really capture some of the value of having diversity, right? So, so the thought is to, to turn to the sort of virtue theoretic social epistemology of diversity uh, by talking about the epistemic virtues and vices of identity diverse groups and institutions. And what you can do is you can compare these virtues to the ones of cognitively diverse groups. So you can maybe talk a little bit about what, what specific um, virtues or vices identity diverse groups bring up. So, so you can see, we don't see cognitive diversity as sort of readily. So maybe that's a little bit different as well. Okay, uh, so I wanna end, hopefully I didn't take up too much time, but I wanna end by with a particular example of a, of a virtue, sorry, it's a mouthful, virtue theoretic social epistemology of diversity. Um, sorry, those are just like key terms to get philosophers interested, but probably turns off anybody else, which is, the paradox of philosophy. Um, so, so I wanna give a particular example of how this type of approach, the, the type of inquiry from this framework. Um, I haven't thought of a good uh, term or phrase for the type of epistemic virtue that I'm interested in, but I'm gonna call it epistemic conscientiousness. And I think it's related to the removal of doubt. So remember uh, when we're looking at the, some of the lessons of the social science research, I said, Part of what's valuable about seeing and expecting difference is that one is primed to expect disagreement and doubt, right? So you expect there's gonna be a difference, so you ex you, you, you're ready for that. Um, so you might remember more information, you might be uh, more willing to engage in debate and disagreement, right? So you might not be bothered by that. So it seems like identity diverse groups expect disagreement and, it, and as a result are better at addressing doubts. Um, they expect doubt, they address doubt. And I think this speak can be connected to, so there's like a really interesting um, sort of uh, inquiry in social epistemology that has to do with group belief. So maybe in virtue of what it means for a group to believe something and for the group to be diverse, maybe there's some real close connection between that, that you have to address a lot more doubt or a diversity of doubts in order for the group to form a belief. Uh, so the suggestion is that identity diverse groups often possess the virtue of being epistemically conscientious. They're somehow more diligent and responsible in addressing doubts. So I think a nice uh, sort of the, the sort of echo chambers produce the corresponding vice. Right? So they're homogeneous groups. Uh, they're not good at addressing doubts. They engage in sort of confirmation bias. So that so there's sort of a vice involved there. Again, I don't know what phrase to use but it seems like diverse groups are more conscientious about um, epistemic matters. Okay, so, so this last part is for philosophers. So you might think, uh, I mean, this is always sort of a uh, virtue epistemologists often try to engage in inquiries that are sort of different from the history of epistemology. But I actually think this connects really, really closely with uh, some of the history of epistemology. In fact, some of the central figures. And I think, so, so here, I think the idea of removing doubt is really central to a lot of epistemology. So, so Descartes took um, doubt and certainty as central to the epistemological project. And he thought that uh, different types of certainty were relevant given one's aims. So if you're familiar with Descartes, you're probably familiar with his meditations. 
And then the meditations, what he was trying to do was this constructive project of providing a ground for the sciences. And he thought there what he needed to do was address all radical doubt, any type of doubt you could think of. But Descartes wasn't crazy. He thought you shouldn't do this all the time. He thought you'd be stupid to do this all the time. You gotta live your life. Um, so he thought, in fact, in normal life, you probably just need something like moral certainty. So, so here, what it meant to be reasonable in believing something and moving forward with it uh, depend upon the sort of doubts that you're, you should eliminate. So that's really essential for Descartes and his idea of what a reason belief is. And finally, just to end, uh, just because I like Peirce, even though he was a terrible person, is that, uh, so Peirce thought, again, that removal of doubt is central to epistemology. Um, so Peirce had a different idea of which doubts were relevant. So he thought, uh, who cares what doubts you could write down? Who cares what doubts someone could propose? What you should do is you should actually eliminate the doubts you have. So famously, he once said of, uh, actually, so oddly, I think Descartes thought something like this too. So I remember, I think Mersenne had this objection to Peirce. And he said, uh, you know, what if the angels could doubt some of the things, these, these like crazy doubts? He's like, who cares? I can't, I can't doubt that. Like an angel can doubt that, but I can't. So, so I think the idea of removing doubt is really, really essential to epistemology. So I actually think that this virtue is a central virtue in um, the sort of history of epistemology. Sorry, that, that was for philosophers. But so the basic idea is that I think the problem that I find when I read the literature is that we don't have a really rich way of thinking about the value of identity diversity. And I think that appealing to um, some of the framework of virtue epistemology and the way that virtue epistemology is taught can give us a sort of more robust, uh, a more substantial account of the value of identity diversity. So that, that's all. Thanks. I will end this. Oh, here we go. Stop. If anything, I taught you how to do PowerPoint and Zoom. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, we'll do, I think, about 15 minutes of Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can either just unmute yourself or type it in the chat and I can say it. <laughs> All right, I'll go, Marmar, if that's okay. Um, Brian, um, great talk. Thanks for giving it. Um, one thing you said that sort of surprised me, I, I really appreciate the turn towards um, virtue epistemology as a way of thinking about the value negative and positive um, of diversity in groups. Um, one thing you said that surprised me was that um, certain epistemic virtues are promoted by surface level diversity. Um, I guess I'm wondering whether the uh, studies you were looking at were looking um, also at the ways that um, the epistemic virtues of marginalized individuals might be harmed um, by the introduction of certain dominant voices into their spaces. So rather than thinking about the spaces as being primarily composed of dominant voices and then we introduce diversity into it, thinking about um, you know, uh, groups of marginalized people who have dominant voices represented into their groups. So I'm, I'm wondering if the the effect you were talking about is generalizable in that way, or if, or if there were certain kinds of groups that were being looked at. Sorry, I, I just need to, can you, so are you saying that in certain cases, um, certain voices get suppressed? Is that the type of case you're imagining? Yeah, so I'm imagining the way certain types of diversity, if we're conceiving of this as representing dominant voices as well as marginalized voices, mm -hmm. if you have homogeneous groups that are composed largely of marginal, a marginalized group, right, introducing dominant voices into that group might actually produce vice. It might damage epistemic confidence. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm thinking about those kinds of cases and, and cases in which certain kinds of 
echo chambers might actually support the cultivation of epistemic virtue. Yeah. I don't know if it, I had a really similar question. So I don't know if it's, if it's all right to jump in with a kind of example that might flesh this out a little yes, more. Yes, please. But, all right, awesome. Give you more time to think, Brian. Um, I, I was thinking about an example that uh, Saba Fatima gives where she thinks that she's being dismissed, uh, that she's not taken to be any kind of authority in an academic setting and how, so that it's a kind of epistemic microaggression. And when she talks about it with some people, they dom primarily like, dominantly situated knowers and people who are generally dominantly situated, I guess, that they doubt her account, that they come up with alternative explanations and that she ends up finding it more helpful to talk with people who've had similar situations uh, happen to them. So that might be just an example, one kind of example of the phenomenon Katie was asking about. I'll stop there. So I guess I have two things to say. So first thing is welcome to the team of virtue theoretic social epistemologists. And I would I think that's a great like example of a type of inquiry I have in mind, to be honest. Um, which is it can turn out that the the makeup of a group can be connected to say, I think certain virtues and vices on in the right context. So I think you're absolutely right. There are cases where homogeneity has certain virtues, but it could also have certain vices as well. And so I think the example Christine gave is, is like perfect is there are certain types of cases where being in a homogeneous group, um, certain knowledge is produced in virtue of the fact that people share experiences, um, especially in the types of cases that you guys mentioned. So, so, so I agree. So I guess to say, absolutely. Um, does that, is that a problem for I don't think that's a problem for the generic approach I have in mind. I think that oftentimes the types of cases that people look at are really simple, contrived examples. So examples where you're like a mock jury, there's like features of that situation that are very contrived. Everybody has like an equal vote. Um, of course, like some of the, I think, previous dynamic, like dynamics, social dynamics are going to still come in. Um, so, so we have to like, I think the idea is like, if we bracket those, which we can, then maybe, uh, maybe there's sometimes benefits and of course costs. Another point I was going to make and I like briefly made uh, during my talk is that there's like really interesting examples where promoting diversity has all these epistemic costs or epistemic benefits and moral costs. So you have to wonder like, like, what do you do? So the example I have in mind is from Caitlin O'Connor and she has this, so she, I think she does it primarily in terms of these like models, but she tries to show that diverse groups are often epistemically beneficial. We know in like groups of um, scientists working together, oftentimes when you have racial and gender diversity, they, they produce better research. But what, what we all know happens is that um, sort of disenfranchised minority groups end up doing more work. So there's, a, there's an unequal distribution of work. Nevertheless, when they work with dominant members, they get more credit. Some, I mean, because if they, if they only work amongst minority members, uh, they'll, be, they'll be part of like a scientific ghetto, which we've seen in history of science. Um, so it, in some sense, it's good for them to work with dominant members, but what ends up happening if they only work with dominant members is they end up doing a lot more work. So there's a lot, it's a lot less fair, um, but then we produce better scientific work. So it's like a weird situation where promoting diversity can be epistemically beneficial yet have all these moral costs that we have to be aware of. So I agree, like this is a really like kind of simplified inquiry where we're limiting the set of values we're considering. I don't know if that addresses the, the type of worry, but I guess I mostly wanted to say, I really like ex I, that, exploring that's like exactly in the, in the type of uh, framework and the type of inquiry I have in mind of exploring diversity. So I think my question would be a follow-up to this. If, so I think, 
I'm curious about a case where a minority person would um, have the option to join a diverse team of other dominant, let's say scientists, and or joining a team where there aren't any moral costs to them being in the team. So um, the one is diverse, but they would be the minority person and their voice, they would have to possibly do more work and their voice might not be heard as much. But then the second option is that it's not as diverse of a group um, and they're still doing science. So the epistemic cost is a little bit less and there is a moral cost to having to not joining a diverse group, do you think it would be, it would be a moral duty for them to have to join the diverse team to promote diversity, even if it comes at some loss to them, moral loss to them? I, I'm wishing I had a nice example right now because I, I read a bunch. Uh, I mean, Caitlin O'Connor, so Caitlin O'Connor is a philosopher at UCI and she studies a lot of this um, stuff. I think the example she had was, uh, I think it was uh, when women started studying, maybe somebody knows the case, it was like early childhood, like development, I forgot what it was, but the thought was that there, there was like, there are cases where people realize that when they start working, with, when minorities start working with dominant members, that there's this unequal distribution of work. And so they just decide to work amongst themselves. But what ends up happening is that their work becomes minimized in the broader scientific community. So she has a nice case, I forgot what it was, but I thought it was of early childhood research uh, where women were in that field, uh, but it's only once men started entering the field that it started getting more credit in the broader scientific community. So I think there's like weird dynamics here. So, so for example, if uh, you just work in homogeneous minority groups, then it might turn out that you're producing lots of good work, but it doesn't produce the right or the fair amount of credit in the broader scientific community. So in some sense, it might be better to allow other members in. I mean, it, this is a weird cost benefit analysis, right? It might be better in the sense that the field might have more credit, but it might be worse because then there, there's other types of injustice that's going on. Um, in the case that you gave, maybe, for the sake of science, it would be better, or for the sake of the field, it would be better, but it would be worse individually. Maybe there's gonna be like psychological costs and other moral costs and other type of like injustice that they bear in virtue of doing that. And so I don't know how to weigh these things. I think these are really hard, hard situations to be in. Um, I, guess, I guess part of what I'm doing is there's lots of complex interactions and so obviously the, the sort of last example I gave where seeing diversity and expecting difference can be can produce certain epistemic virtues in groups. It is like a real simplified example, but it's, I was just trying to give an example of how this type of framework and approach might look. Um, and I agree that um, you know, these are simplified cases and then when you add a complexity to them, it might, everything might screw up, everything might get more complicated, I agree. And, and that's part of the, um, it's gonna be part of the inquiry as well, how these things interact. Thanks. Awesome, I think Dr. Um, Mary Danico had a question. She raised her hand earlier. Um, it wasn't really a question. It's just more of a comment. Hi, Brian. Um, I'm, I'm the sociologist in the house. Oh, awesome. <laughs> but, um, no, I really appreciate you, you know, being inclusive of thinking about sociology and psychology in your examination of virtues and identity diversity. Um, you know, I, I was a communications minor, so I loved philosophy for a bit, but I, I always get a little confused by philosophy. So we I love to, everyone who loves us. So. Right. I have to totally pay attention, you know, but um, Cicero and Aristotle are some of my role models, you know, literary role models. I did want to mention kind of referring to um, Catherine and Christine's comments about the different scenarios. I think, you know, there's not, in my opinion, there's not necessarily a specific formula to look at identity diversity because it's context that really matters. So, and I think that's what Catherine and Christine were talking about, you know, whether it's toxic masculinity, where there's mansplaining, you know, when in a predominantly, 
you know, female um, group, or whether it's white splaining, you know, with uh, with a lot of ethnic minority groups. And so I think it's that power differentials that happens in in society. So I think context matters. And so I think it's really important, as I think you were alluding to, to show the diversity of diversity, right, in, in scenarios where sometimes it can be very positive to have differences of thoughts. But I would really encourage everyone listening on to think about the context, because I think it's the context that helps us frame the analysis, because otherwise there is not a perfect like formula or scenario to help unpack um, identity diversity. So I just wanted to provide that insight. Yeah, I, one of the things I really liked from reading a lot of the sociology of diversity is like the starting point changes. So I think the starting point is not, um, are the costs worth whatever benefits we imagine? I think the starting point is, well, when, like, when and where, and like, all these variables, you start thinking, oh, how, how do I get diversity to be beneficial in the right ways? Like, I think the starting point is uh, a different one than say the public imagines. So I, yeah, I, I like that. Well, I think also like not all diversity is always good. So I think like they talk about currently right now with the Congress or Senate and having QAnon, I don't know if any of you are QAnon, so I apologize if you like QAnon, but like having QAnon conspirators is really providing more diversity of thought in that space, but it's not necessarily a positive thing, you know? So I think, again, it's context is, um, I think it's really important. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. I, I would like to offer, um, I guess, an observation and also like, I'm not a philosopher nor a sociologist. So um, maybe what I'm going to offer doesn't make a lot of sense. So please forgive me, but this is based on what Marmar asked and it reminded me of, um, I, I was talking to a recent graduate of a PhD program, and he's from a minority group. And he got an offer from a very prestigious university and that's much less diverse and also an offer from a university much more like ours that's less prestigious, but very diverse. And he was trying to figure out if he wanted to represent his um, diverse group, minority group, and go to this prestigious university because that's what everybody expects him to do and says, you know, how great it would be if he could represent his group in a place like that versus being able to teach the kind of students he wanted to be able to interact with at a university more like ours. And so there's, I don't know, like if you can comment on that, like the, the cost at a personal level versus a group level and yeah, I remember, so I, I don't know if I have a comment, but I taught at Bowdoin College for a year and Bowdoin's, well, Maine is, I think the whitest state in the country. Um, and Bowdoin is also, they, they try hard, but it, it's a pretty homogeneous and fairly wealthy. Um, the students are from pretty wealthy backgrounds. And I remember every year something happens at Bowdoin. Um, so so it's, there's always some group of students that do something terrible and then every year, the students, um, you know, the, the minority students not only have to bear the brunt of that harm, but then now they're responsible for teaching the, the students. I mean, so I remember, I forgot what happened that year, but I think it was like the hockey team had some Thanksgiving party where they dressed, I, I forgot what it was, they dressed in some inappropriate way. And it was like every year um, this happened. And so there's this like double cost to them, the, these students that not only have to bear the brunt of the harms, but also have to be responsible for repairing them. Uh, so yeah, I mean, th that's a moral good, but a moral cost as well. I don't know. I, yeah, I think a lot of us have experienced similar things. Um, I definitely have, so yeah. Thanks. I, I, I agree. Like it's it's hard to. I think what's problematic about the type of inquiry that I'm engaged in, I've, I've constrained the inquiry so much that then now how do you go and apply it to the real world? Um, yeah, I think that's always difficult for a philosophy. I think what I'm trying to do 
is strip a lot of the complexity away to gain some theoretical understanding. And then if you ask me like, okay, how do I apply it to a particular situation? I think I'm agreeing with what Mary said and said, yeah, I, it, there's a lot of contextual features that need to be accounted for. Uh, but in terms of gaining that theoretical understanding, it's often helpful um, to, to have simple sort of simple models. I think Dr. Ross has his hand up and then Alex. Yeah, I just want to make a quick note that uh, thinking about the importance of context um, really suggests that, uh, that Brian's choice of an Aristotelian framework uh, makes a lot of sense. As far as that, that framework providing a rich one for thinking about context, um, because Aristotle's famous for thinking about all the variables when it comes to virtues. Um, and so there's no simple formula. And so, yeah, that's just a support for your choice of framework. Thanks, tag team partner. <laughs> So uh, I wanted to say, I think, so great talk and I really enjoyed the discussion as well. I think another, an additional resource for, for thinking through some of the questions that have come up is kind of like thinking about groups embedded within groups and sort of broadening out the, the context. And so even if you're just talking about one group, like a jury, to say that like diversity is better doesn't mean that like all of the decision-making happens together. Like there are times when you're like alone and thinking about things and then you come together as a group. And in the Netflix example, there were two independent groups that created their models independently, and then they came together as a group, and that was the best solution, you know. And so, like, so more broadly, if we're thinking about like society as a whole benefiting from diversity, that doesn't mean all 330 million Americans all together the whole time debating everything. And you know, and so you can also you mean you can also think about like the structure of our university. It's like you have faculty meetings and then you have representatives of the faculty go to other meetings and you have student club meetings, and then you have meetings with the students and the faculty. And so like there's room for and this all goes towards, you know, vindicating context and stuff. So there's room for saying that, like, um, you know, even if there are like moments where more homogeneity is called for, that might be part of a broader democratic process where we benefit from you know, bringing different perspectives together. If you're saying we should have more meetings then I'm against you. Just kidding, I totally agree. <laughs> no. I appreciate the comments though. That, that's, that's really helpful. Thanks people for listening. Thank you so much for this talk. It was, it was great. I think it's been one of the best talks that we've had and that's not just because I'm a former philosophy major. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, thanks for inviting me Marmar. I really, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. It was great. Um, if there aren't any other questions we can finish the talk and then we'll go on to presentations after maybe a two minute break. All right, great. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Thanks everybody. So we'll be back at 2.12. Hey, Winnie, you're, you're here for um, just an update for the RISCA stuff. The third reviewer is getting it to me later. So once I get hers, if it's not tonight, it'll be tomorrow morning. I'm just waiting for hers. Yeah, thank you. No, thank okay. you for working extra time on that. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, just I, I, I don't want to give you an incomplete response. So I just I'm just waiting. So she promised me she's going to get it done tonight. But okay. today. Okay. okay, thanks. I was super impressed that we had that many, like 50 some applications for the yeah. webinar. I thought that yeah. was great. Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to be kind of institutionalized like we talked about and something, another way to support our students. So yeah, I was excited.
Ed, would you like, what kind of like designation would you like to see on the RISCA schedule? Um, like a little asterisk or do you think a W would, I mean, of course we will explain what it is and probably have a link to mm -hmm. the Weglin page so they could get more information, but. You know, in the Weglin logo, there's that one little squiggly thing in the beginning. I don't know, I can send it, you know, the Weglin logo that we have, maybe that little squiggly thing is what we could put in front or whatever is easiest for you all, you know, whatever works. Um, yeah, um, if you could send me that logo, yeah, then we yeah. could crop that part. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, because that might be a nice little, you know, because kind of consistent with the Weglin logo. Yeah. yeah. And then I think we, um, I think Kelly sent you the, the moderators, right? The names of the moderators for Riska too. So you should, I think, I think it was in the email response of who's, um, I think Kelly's on, so, so but um, yeah, if not, I'll send it to you. There, are, I think there are three or four of us who offer, who volunteer to be moderators. Okay, so. I will look through my email and then if I can't find it, I'll um, let you know. Yeah, or or Kelly can just resend it to you right now. Okay, I think she's on. So she's, yeah, I can yeah. I can resend it to you, Dr. Dong. No problem. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly, of course. So, yeah, it's it's kind of we don't know who's listening to our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone, <laughs> but I guess this is how it would be if we're in the hallways talking, right? After a meeting and we're just talking, and there are people around, they just hear our conversation. <laughs> I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens, right? So don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> We're kind of you're embarrassed. You're like, oh my gosh, people hurt. <laughs> it's okay. And at, right, least, at least it's not. We're not walking out with toilet paper stuck on our feet, you know. So you can't see that. Right. Right. <laughs> Fall off the back of your pants. Right. I, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Quick introduction. Are your zippers down or spinach on your teeth. <laughs> right, exactly. Or food in your mouth, you know, stuck between your teeth. A uh, quick introduction. I'm Devonya Jordan in the Career Center. I'm a Career Center counselor, um, better known today as Career Specialist. So I don't know if we've met, but now we know each other. <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you. Yeah, Mary Danico, uh, Sociology. I also direct the Wegland Endowed Chair and um, 